Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive. You probably know us from a lot of BMW i3 specific videos, but recently we managed to get a hold of the fully electric Mini. So it's the Mini Cooper SE. Only one version is available as of right now, and that is the three door hatchback. So we thought we would take you around it and show you all the things there are to know about it from the outside, the inside, and bits of the drivetrain from the perspective of people who have sold almost 450 i3s at this point. Mini as a brand is owned by BMW, so the Cooper SE inherited a lot of technology and drivetrain from the i3s. So that's the reason why we position the cars side by side, because I may refer back to the i3 a lot. This particular example is the facelift, so it does have a slightly revised front bumper and newer headlights, but the drivetrain has remained unchanged and most of the features carried over from the previous generation, so it's a very, very mild facelift. The grille looks like the standard Mini Cooper grille with a combustion engine. It just has a few more blanked off bits, and the easiest way of spotting that this is an electric version, other than some of them having the green strip on the number plate, is that the S has a yellow inlay in it. Just like BMW used to use blue accents to highlight that a car is electric, Mini is going with yellow all round. Whilst I'm here in the front, let's take a look what's hiding underneath the bonnet. You can't use the key to pop open the bonnet like on the i3 because there is no frunk. It is a front wheel drive layout car, so it's mostly occupied by electronics and you have to use a standard bonnet release to pop open the bonnet. The key is shared with the combustion engine minis as well, so there is no button for preconditioning either, which is a bit of a shame because we know it is a very loved feature on the i3. Before we move on to the motor, this is a good opportunity to show the clamshell bonnet design, where the edges essentially spill over to the area where normally you would have a quarter panel and the front bumper, which means that when you open it up, you've got massive cutouts for the iconic mini headlights. On this top of the line level three trim level, these feature matrix technology, which means that the high beam can be pretty much turned on all the time. And there's a camera in the windscreen, which makes sure that any other oncoming cars are blocked out from the high beam. So you don't dazzle other drivers. If I take off this protective cover, we have got the motor and all the electronics, which on the i3 are pretty much housed underneath the boot floor, organized under the bonnet here on the Mini. They are all housed within this, what looks like steel or aluminum frame. And what most likely happens is that they are pre-assembled in the factory and then the entire thing is dropped in just like an engine would be. And that's because it is using a combustion engine car platform. So this is just an adaptation of the petrol and diesel Mini. BMW or Mini, they have done a fairly decent job. The space is quite well utilized and all Mini electrics come with the heat pump as standard, which also obviously takes a bit more space than just regular electric heater and air conditioning compressor. There's a lot of debate online whether the motor is the same as the i3 or slightly tweaked. From the numbers, it looks like it's shared with the i3s, which again is the same motor as the i3, just tuned for a little bit more power. And the biggest difference between the driving characteristics of the Mini and the i3 will be based down on the fact that the i3 is rear wheel drive and the Mini is front wheel drive. But we will have a separate video covering the driving dynamics and the range in real world conditions. So make sure to subscribe to not miss that one. Moving further down the side, we need to discuss wheels and tire options. This is a huge topic on the i3, but it's a little bit easier on the Mini. We have got a choice of 16 and 17 inch alloys in different styles. These resemble the kind of standard Mini Cooper S wheels, but you can get a design which is dedicated to the Mini Electric, which looks like a three pin UK socket. And in terms of tires, this 2021 car is riding on Hankook Ventus S1 Evo 3 summer tires. With the wheel size being quite common, you've got a lot more tire options to choose from than the i3, whether that's summer, all season or winter ones as these wheels are used on many internal combustion engine minis and other vehicles. In terms of widths, we have a square setup running on the Mini because we've got the motor powering the front wheels, whereas on the i3 it's a bit more complicated, but most versions come with a staggered setup, meaning you get slightly wider tires on the rear axle because again, the motor is powering the rear wheels. Moving further down the side, it's a pretty standard Mini. 
the level three equipped with comfort access has a little button which you can use to lock and unlock the car. The fuel filler cap has been replaced by an electric charge port door. It occupies the same space, but unfortunately, unlike the i3, there's not much of a light to show the charge port. So if you're charging at night, it's a bit more cumbersome, but it uses the same CCS port with the two plug design to keep water out. The Mini is designed to handle 50 kilowatt rapid charging rate, very similar to the i3, and it's limited to 125 amps of maximum charging current. On the back, we have got this lovely Union Jack shaped full LED tail lights. And the big question is the boot, given it's a fairly compact car. But if we look at that, other than the world's tiniest partial shelf, there is an option which is quite handy because all the electronics live under the bonnet. You do have a false floor and that's where you can keep all of your charging cables and your first aid kit. If you want to, the floor can be positioned in two steps. So you can have it either in a lower position where you have a tiny bit more space in terms of height in the boot. But then if you fold the seats down, which do split fold, there is a bit of a ridge, so the floor can be lifted. Honestly, this is the stupidest design ever. And in that case, you've got a completely flat loading bay and no edge to lift heavy things over. Volume-wise, it's a tiny bit smaller than the i3, but realistically, neither of these cars are probably going to be carrying loads of stuff and it's definitely enough for something like a weekly shop. The last exterior difference worth pointing out compared to the i3 is that because this car features a much more traditional metal chassis, it can be equipped with optional roof rails. It's just important that these need to be specified from factory. They cannot be added later on. It's quite a rare option on the used car market. So if you're after one with them, it will be probably a very difficult thing to find them. Personally, I prefer the look without them. And obviously with the car being electric, it is a bit aerodynamically more efficient without the bars on the roof. So that's pretty much everything covered on the outside. And now let's take a look at the interior. There is a lot of things to discuss, even though basically it's just like any petrol or diesel mini, which means that the materials are quite nice. The top of the dashboard is all soft touch and so are the tops of the door cards. And it's only if you go lower down, you get slightly more scratchy plastics. But honestly, that's to be expected at this price point. The seats are absolutely lovely. They have quite significant side bolstering. So you've got lots of support, even if you take the corners a bit too quickly. They have a lot more adjustment than the i3 seats. So all of the versions are still manual, probably to save on weight, but you can adjust the seat base length and you also have manually adjustable lumbar support. So if you really care about seat comfort, especially on longer journeys, or you've got a very sensitive back, this is probably going to be the better option. As I mentioned, being the level three, it has all the gadgets, but first let's talk about the standard equipment. All electric minis come with this dedicated instrument cluster behind the steering wheel. It's half digital and half analog. So if I fire up the car, on the side, the power meter is essentially an analog needle, which is just nicely backlit. So it looks very sharp and digital. That's in contrast to the display itself in between the dials, which is a little bit fuzzy. And I know after I said this with the Nissan Aria, many people were saying, oh, it's the anti-reflective coating. Yes, but it can be done a little bit better. Look at Apple devices. They've got some of the best anti-reflective displays on the market and they look tech sharp. The nice thing is, especially compared to something like an i3, which has a very simple display, is that once you start the sat-nav, the arrows showing you where to go are going to appear on that instrument cluster display as well. The infotainment system is extremely similar to the BMW one. It's pretty much the same thing, just reskinned with slightly different graphics. On the facelift, you get the big screen as standard, whereas before you had the choice of the smaller screen on the level one and level two trims, and only the level three would get the full widescreen display. Because it's quite close to you, as opposed to on the i3 where it's up on the dash, it's a touchscreen in addition to having the iDrive jog wheel. 
and this makes a really big difference when you for example use CarPlay which is standard on all Mini Electrics because CarPlay really has been designed with touch in mind and it's a lot easier to use than trying to use the jog wheel. So if CarPlay and kind of up-to-date connectivity are of great importance, the Mini is a great choice for that. The other thing the Mini has which the i3 doesn't, at least on this level 3, is a heads-up display. I'm afraid I will not sugarcoat it, it's not very good. It's one of those cheaper style head-up displays which is basically a plastic shield which pops up from the dash and the information is projected into it instead of the windscreen glass itself. And for my driving position and the way I'm seated, even though you can adjust the plastic shield, it literally projects into the windscreen wipers. So not very useful as a head-up display meant to be used while you're looking out at the road. If we look at the rest of the switch gear, it's again carried over from the petrol and diesel minis. This means that the gear selector is like a normal automatic style gear selector from a BMW, not the more quirky style which is on the i3 on the steering column. All electric minis come with dual zone climate as standard and as I mentioned it's powered by the heat pump system so it should be nice and efficient. However, heated seats are only available on the level 2 and 3, not on the base spec. In traditional mini fashion you've got these toggle switches which control for example the parking sensors and if you look closely you also have adjustable region. With the i3 it's only one setting and you have to regulate it using the throttle pedal. That's what the mini defaults to as well but if I tap the toggle you can go into low region mode where the car feels a bit more like normal petrol automatic where it only gently slows down when you lift off the accelerator pedal. There is still some region available and it will bring you to a complete stop and the car does not creep on its own. More details on that will be in the separate driving video and as you can see we already started a bit of testing because we have got the OBD dongle plugged in to see whether there's any difference between the region being on high or low in terms of energy efficiency. With the cockpit complete let's try the impossible task and that is me fitting behind myself in one of these three door minis. So I will move this seat forward so you can see a little bit better. The front seat is in my usual driving position. Being a three door you do have to get out of the car if you want to let someone in and out of the back and slide this forward. Now let's see, do this as elegantly as possible. Once you're in it's actually not too bad because I do have enough headroom and I do fit. Now the question is whether I will fit in here and this, yeah, this, this I'm afraid does not fit. The, so the, the seat just clicked into place but my knees are literally digging into the backrest and my feet are kind of locked in place. The battery in these mini electrics is quite unique because it's not a bespoke EV platform. It fills the space which the fuel tank and the exhaust and the transmission system would use. So it's a kind of a T shape, which means that I do have quite deep footwells, but as I said, my feet are kind of locked in place. And maybe this is good for a couple of miles to go down to the pub, but nothing more, I'm afraid. On the positive side, at least if you have triplets, is that you've got three isofix points in this car. So obviously two of the rear seats, this is only a four-seater, but the front seat has isofix points as well. So if you, for example, have a small baby who you want by your side as a driver, it's a very good option. And it's a shame that there is not a bit more room in here in the back, because the panoramic roof, unlike on the i3, extends all the way back. It's split into two. The rear pane of glass does not open, whereas the front one does, but it does make the rear bench feel a lot more spacious than it is. I can't really complain too much though because the Cooper SE is about 15 centimeters shorter than the i3 and this is realistically where the 15 centimeters went. While I'm sitting in the back I have also noticed that we've got the Harman Kardon sound system. I was never that big of a fan of the Harman Kardon sound system in the i3. While it's good I was never quite blown away by it whereas with the Mini the moment I jumped in it it really sounds amazing and I can see why many people who are coming from minis to i3s say that they must have the Harman Kardon sound system. I haven't heard the standard sound system on the level 2s but it's definitely something now which I can appreciate why many people want it and it's a great option to have on this level 3. Keep in mind that not all of them have it because as the chip shortage started affecting supply chains Harman Kardon was dropped from many of the BMW and Mini products. 
Similarly, in an effort to simplify manufacturing, I believe level 1 has been dropped entirely from the product range now and that makes sense. It really wasn't the best option in our opinion. It lacked even some basics like for example rear parking sensors, whereas the level 2 is quite well equipped. With both level 2 and 3 you used to be able to get options like the adaptive cruise control for example, but that's no longer available, again in an effort to simplify manufacturing. And even though the car itself does have the camera for adaptive cruise, because that's used for the traffic sign recognition and the driving assistant, it's the wiring harness in the steering wheel which is different because there are additional buttons for the adaptive cruise control and I suppose many reckoned that it's a very rare option on a city car, so it was dropped from the offer entirely and I believe at the time being the only options you can pick are obviously the different wheels, different exterior colors, the sun protection glass, in other words privacy glass in the back and the roof rails. I don't want to make the video too long so let me try to get out elegantly yet again and conclude with some final thoughts, just about managed there. The biggest question with these mini electrics is usually the battery size. It's very similar to the previous generation of the i3s, so the 94 amp hour battery, and I'm specifically saying similar because even though many people assume that because the ranges and the battery capacities look pretty much identical on paper, that is the same battery, it's not. The i3 uses prismatic cells manufactured by Samsung, whereas the Mini Cooper has prismatic cells yet again, but manufactured by CATL with a slightly different chemistry. And those have been specifically designed to fit into the transmission tunnel and into the fuel tank area. Realistically, we think the range is sufficient for what it is at the end of the day. It still is a city car, and especially if you're coming from some of the previous generation i3s, the Mini seems to be quite reliable in terms of winter range with the addition of the standard heat pump and has quite a few nice options on it. If you want to transition from the i3 with the biggest battery pack, you will take some range penalty, I'm afraid. But the biggest difference between these two is probably the driving experience. So that's what we will cover in the next video. And I reckon that's what will decide for most people which one they will go for. Because even though the i3 is rear wheel drive, those skinny wheels and the quite tall body, which has to have quite stiffly sprung suspension to keep it all under control, handles completely differently to something like this Mini Cooper SE, which even though is converted from the petrol version, it still has the distinct go-kart character. And thanks to the battery pack not being in the floor, it means that the seat is pretty much directly above the road and you sit really, really low and you feel very well connected to the car. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much for watching. Hit the like button if you're excited for the driving comparison video where we will compare real world efficiency as well. And until then, leave a comment which one of the two cars you would go for. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.